Good morning to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com here. Thursday now, the 23rd of May, 2024. Got the webcam working at least for now, so let's enjoy it while it lasts. On the hurricane outlook and discussion today, we're going to uh, take a look at the NOAA forecast. It's, uh, I think, the busiest one and the most aggressive forecast they have ever issued. We're going to look at that. I'm sure you've already seen the data, but we're just going to kind of reinforce it and really underscore the fact that we could be looking at a as they said, an extraordinary hurricane season with societal impacts for a lot of people. And we have to really take this seriously, especially with everything else going on on the periphery with geopolitics and you know just your everyday lives are very busy, I'm sure. And we have to keep severe weather and hurricanes on the forefront so that we are mentally prepared to physically deal with what could be going on later. All right, that's my job, to inform you, keep you in front of this stuff. We don't want you to get behind it. So starting things off, tweet here from our friends at Fox Weather. Yes, the NOAA hurricane forecast, very aggressive. 17 to 25 named storms, 8 to 13 hurricanes, 4 to 7 category 3 or higher. Very significant there, very similar to the numbers from Colorado State University. And, you know, what else can we say? It's looking like a very busy season. Here's the graphic from NOAA themselves. And again, just kind of reiterating this. 17 to 25 of the named storms, 8 to 13 hurricanes. That's a lot if we have that high side, 13 hurricanes. 15 is the record, by the way, back in 2005, if memory serves. And an ACE, the accumulated cyclone energy, which tells us about the quality and the longevity of such storms, expected to be 150 to 245 percent. I mean, 245, are you serious? That's crazy of normal. And the highest name storms, you know, everything in the May outlook. And, um, wow. Uh, the normals, of course, are 14, 7, and 3. So we're getting close to potentially doubling all of the metrics here. And, of course, we know the warm Atlantic, the AMO, we've been talking about that, and the La Nina that's possibly coming on. And here are some different particulars in their graphic. I'll put a link to this in today's description if you want to look at it. And, um, you know, it's, it's potentially, as they said, going to be extraordinary. And we as Americans and everybody else around the Caribbean, Central America, Mexico, all of us in the Atlantic Basin and even elsewhere over across the big pond over here, um, the Iberian Peninsula up to the British Isles, the UK, yes, this is your problem too because these hurricanes can often come around and then end up way over here later on. Just something to think about. And these hurricanes can come in and disrupt the oil industry in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, either U.S. interest or, what is it, Pemex down here, the Mexican oil interest, and that affects the globe. So this is a really big deal, and we need to treat it as such. All right, so here again is the culprit, at least some of it. Very warm Atlantic AMO, been pointing this out ad nauseum. Still there, not going anywhere. And then there is the makings of our La Nina coming on. The stage is just about set. We're almost to June, and we know what's coming, at least potentially. It certainly seems that way. And right on cue, we do have an area down here, low probabilities of development. It's in a large area of low pressure. Um, environmental conditions are not expected to be conducive overall for significant development. But as we talk about a lot, this is currently and will continue to bring heavy rain for portions of this region of our friends in the Caribbean there. So we have to remember all the different hazards from tropical systems and even disturbances like this one, um, you know, need to be taken into consideration. And we can see it really, uh, really nicely here on the satellite imagery. There's our system, not very well organized at all. After all, it is May 23rd. The bigger stuff, the more organized and more potent stuff is coming later. We're just starting to warm things up, so to speak. So, yeah, but nevertheless, heavy rainfall, a potential across portions of Hispaniola, southeast Bahamas, Turks, Caicos, eastern Cuba, that vicinity, so just be aware of that. And, uh, again, I love this product here from the University of Wisconsin, really helping to point out the vorticity or the energy down there at the lower levels. And as you can see, not really matching my definition of something to be too concerned about in terms of further significant organization, but there is some energy down there. We can see that in the low-level vorticity field, but it's not bundling just yet. 
some opportunity for further organization as it moves out into the southwest Atlantic over here, but I'm not too concerned with it, and it's not really part of the overall, oh, this is a signal that we're going to have that big hurricane season. You know, just sometimes stuff happens randomly. Uh, the real, I think, test will be to see once we get into June, do we get more prolific development every time there's a window of favorability over here, and do we start getting development between Africa and the Lesser Antilles in June, once those bona fide tropical waves come off, and I think we have our first one out there analyzed now from the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch, uh, these pieces of energy that come off Africa and propagate westward, will those develop in June? That'll be a telltale sign that we're going to have a very active season. But even if June is quiet, believe me, August, September, and October could be absolutely like a track race, just crazy busy. But we will be looking for signs early on starting in June. All right, speaking of looking for signs, this is the GFS from the 6Z run. And again, it's that 850 millibar part of the atmosphere. And you can see that disturbed weather down here in the modeling, but it's all diffuse and spread out, not concentrated. So let's see if it ever does, according to the operational here, get more concentrated. And it tries to, as you can see out here at about 24 hours, probably overdoing it, taking a piece of energy and sort of blowing it up prematurely, whatever, aggressively. I mean, we'll know this time tomorrow when I do my update, is that what it looks like? And i got to remember to save this graphic. I, if I do forget, I can go back and just look because of Dr. Cowan's site here. We can go back in the archives. But the GFS is somewhat bullish on this, trying to concentrate a little bit better. But then it, it kind of moves on out, not too far south and east of Bermuda. We'll see. It looks like it's still got somewhat of a frontal characteristic attached to it. Not your best consolidated, purebred-looking tropical system, but a disturbance nonetheless, and uh, we'll see what happens over the coming days. So moving this on out into the future for about the next week or so, pretty solid trades just coming on across through the Caribbean. Nothing, all this vorticity is stretched out, nothing concentrating as we get out to about a week. Looking at the Euro, this is the 6Z run as well, only goes out to 90 hours, but that's enough for now. It doesn't do too much with our system out there, as you can clearly see. Stretches that vorticity out, and this is a great example of that. All of that energy is pulled out, you know, like cotton candy or putty or whatever. It's not in a nice ball of energy, or what we call vorticity. Conservation of angular momentum, all that good stuff. The bundling of the heat, however you want to put it. This is not that, and it doesn't even look at, look like it's going to be that way uh, through the 90-hour time frame on the Euro here from the 6Z run. So, as I mentioned yesterday, and this is another reminder from a tweet today from Ben Ben Noel, and it's interesting here that he puts this word, and he chooses his words wisely, believe me. You know, we're not in this for uh, clicks and likes and whatever. If you like what we do and you click on it, well, that means that you trust what we're saying. And when Ben says something that is uh, that catches your attention, like he uses significant, or you, you get what I'm saying, we trust Ben, and when Ben says something like significant, you need to pay attention. And let me use yellow to highlight it better. So he says a significant convective pulse, that's the green area, is poised to propagate into the Atlantic Ocean during the second week of June. And we've been eyeing this for the last several days. This will likely make the environment more conducive to tropical development, such as through a reduction in wind shear, and this is the science, this is what we learned from this, particularly over the Caribbean. And that is especially important because the Caribbean is where we would look for development, climatologically speaking, this time of year. And getting into the portion of June that Ben is you know, highlighting here, the second week of June. So here's the, uh, the map, the animation. And as you can see, not favorable now. And as we get into June, it does look a lot more favorable with rising motion here, settled over the Atlantic Basin, and that is a conducive signature for development. And we'll just watch and see. All right? So again, severe weather, still an active issue out here in the plains. I'm currently in the Dallas-Fort Worth area with Greg Nordstrom. We went down here yesterday towards Brownwood and got on what we thought was going to be a big hail producer. It got darker 
than the total eclipse was, and I saw a few other chasers uh, mentioning this as well, that they were down there. It was literally within just a few seconds. It'd be like if this room here, somebody just turned down the lights to almost total darkness. It was bizarre. And there was that greenish look to the sky, and the radar indicated a lot of big hail was coming, but we almost had nothing. Very, very strange situation. Uh, some theories are that the hail core was collapsing, and it was still up aloft, though, and then the hail that was still there was falling into a warmer layer. But with that much energy in the signature on the radar, we expected there would at least be a lot of small hail. We saw some hail, but it was nothing like what we were anticipating. So that was yesterday. What about today and beyond? Again, severe weather, obviously a big issue. We had the tornado down there in the Temple area. And we remember the tornado in the Greenfield, Iowa area from the other day. Devastating loss of life, the damage, you know, this is all compounded. And people are getting a little bit tired of it, I'm sure. The tornadoes are kind of back, you know. It's been a few years since we've had this many like this, right? So we have to pay attention to it. So today's threat, you know, tornado, low but not zero. I'll show you, stole that from this next tweet over here that I'm going to show you. Now, the wind threat, mainly up in way northern Canada, Canada, nope, Kansas, and southern Nebraska. Canada will get theirs. They get severe weather, too. It's coming later in the month, and uh, or really into June and beyond. And then the hail threat, a really large area of potential two-inch hail. That's the hatched area. Low chance, but nevertheless, it's there. All right, so that's today. Uh, why are we not working here, Mr. Mouse? There we are. This is tomorrow, so... Not much action where we are, and you can see the slight risk over here outlining the tornado. Got to pay attention. Wind, hail, yep, more significant where Greg and I will be, so maybe we'll get out there tomorrow. We'll see. But then Saturday is what has a lot of people's attention because more energy, more dynamics, everything's going to be in place for a significant severe weather outbreak in the heart of Tornado Alley. Memorial Day weekend, there will be literally thousands of chasers I will be here through this, and of course, we are looking for giant hail, part of this new project. It is very difficult, by the way. It's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. You think the hunting tornadoes is hard for people that want to see the photogenic tornadoes? We don't want to ever see them go through land that is occupied by us, right? Or animals. I mean, sure, you know, we're not like that, but they're spectacular to see. It's a force of nature that's just amazing. And those are already difficult enough uh, to find, depending on where you are and what your experience is. Uh, I figured hail would be a lot easier, but the large hail, that's a much harder nut to crack, so to speak. Uh, but we're going to continue on with it as we develop this project to really increase awareness about the, the really the economic impact of, of hail. $60 billion of insured losses last year alone. So yes, it's a pretty big deal and want to make sure that we're not ignoring it, but it's just a lot harder than I thought. Anyway, this is what Oklahoma Mesonet tweeted. I thought this was great, and um, this is their little infographics. Today's severe risk, I like it. It says low but not zero, and that's that brown area and the green area. Tornado threat, low but not zero. The hail threat is slight, maybe baseball size hail in Oklahoma, and that's where Greg and I will be going later today, it looks like. And then there's the wind and uh, just the overall threats. And then, of course, Saturday... They're out looking this area, looking at SPC data. Make sure you have a plan if you're in this area. People are they're exhausted of it, I'm sure, but that doesn't matter. Nature's going to keep throwing these punches, and we have to, number one, be aware and just know that this stuff could be coming and be ready to take action to save your life. That's the most important thing. All right, looking at the high-resolution guidance before I let you go here, this is the latest HER, the high-resolution rapid refresh model, one of many convectively and allowing models, but for the sake of time, we're just going to look at this. This is 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 5, 6, 7, 8. The herd doesn't show much at all in Oklahoma, so maybe Greg and I won't be doing that. But look, near the Metroplex here, there's some clusters of storms. We'll see. He and I have got some chatting to do about what we're going to do today. Our target will be over here in southwest Oklahoma, or we could just sit tight and see what develops in and south and west of the Metroplex and not have to drive 10 hours today. Anyway, 
we'll see what happens. All right. So let me get me back. Hey, the cam worked the whole time. That's great. Yeah, so very busy hurricane season coming up this Memorial Day weekend. You gather family around or whatever, and you're down in these hurricane-prone areas. Just talk about it a little bit. You know, hey, I've been hearing we're going to have a potentially very busy season. What are we going to do about it? What can we do about it? Just get that ball rolling. Everything you do now is a step towards being less stressed later because it is very, very stressful. Just a couple of other notes here. We are continuing to work on our Hurricane U series, that educational series, kind of like a podcast uh, with uh, like a deeper dive into what we're looking at each hurricane season. And one of the topics that I will address in the coming weeks is the mental health side of all of this, the doom and gloom part. How do we take this information and turn it into something actionable? How do we deal with the stress of everything? I actually talked to somebody that knows everything about that. That, among other topics coming forth, uh, including insurance and how to deal with that, you know, trying to get you ready for the upcoming season. There's just a lot going on, and in your life, I'm sure, too. So with that, I thank you for tuning in to the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion from all of us at the Hurricane Track team and our community. We appreciate you joining in and watching. Have a great rest of your Thursday. I'm Mark Suttoth. We'll talk to you tomorrow morning.